And uh, the Lord gave me a good message, I thought, that was appropriate for the moment. I went in my office earlier this week, and I sat down and, and started to kind of uh, figure out where I wanted to go this week. I, I don't always know, and I don't plan months ahead like some people who are better than I am. So I just said quietly to the Lord, where do we need to go? And he gave me this message and next week's message all at one time. I call it search and rescue. It comes out of the book of Luke chapter 15, which I personally think is just, it's just the supreme part of scripture. It is the, Jesus was the best storyteller of anybody that I've ever read after. And the stories that he told had meaning, they had purpose, and I hope that that happens as well today. We're going to talk about the lostness of man. What does that mean? Some years ago, there was a, a group of Christians got together and they united for a kind of an evangelistic outreach where they displayed bumper stickers on their cars that read, I found it. Now, they were referring to Jesus. I never knew he was lost. I didn't find him. He found me. But nevertheless, it was an opportunity for them then to witness, and it was provided when people would kind of uh, read the bumper sticker and then come up and say, what did you find? Well, at that point, they were able to share that they had found Jesus and that he had changed their life, and we understood that. As always, there was a, a group of non-believers who mounted a kind of, of counter campaign where they came up with a, a bumper sticker and it read, I never lost it. <laughs> well, they were right. In our culture today, that's the view of most people. It prevails. I'm not lost. What have I lost? Where am I lost? In fact, it even becomes somewhat mm, offensive to some people if you say to them, you're lost. So what does loss mean? What does it, how do, what does it look like when we're talking about that? Because I think that's uh, kind of uh, important. Because we, we live in a, in a day of religious secretism where one person's belief is as valid as anybody else's. That sounds good on paper, but this doesn't back it up, okay? I'm sorry to say that. So the idea of people being lost and needing salvation kind of holds an offense to people. They don't really like that. For an example, if, if you had a child, a little child, I saw a program the other day where two young girls had been kidnapped and they had been kept for years and years and years. Suppose you had a little child, and that child was kidnapped and, and never found for years. Years would go by. Years would go by. Maybe 20 years. And then all of a sudden, that child was found through DNA, whatever. It doesn't matter. They were found. You know, that child never has a sense of their lostness. They don't rightly remember who their parents were. They were so small when they were taken. They might not remember mom and dad. But mom and dad never forget. Never a day would go by that they wouldn't remember that child being taken. So it is with people of today. They sometimes don't know they're lost. They don't understand they're away from God the Father. They don't understand they're out there. And, and it may take a long time to bring them in and then convince them that you're lost. God alone knows who lost people are even though they have no sense of their lostness. Do you understand that? Jesus reveals, I believe, the heart of the gospel in Luke 15. 
he tells three short stories consecutively that have great, great meaning. He talks about the lost sheep, and then he talks about the lost coin, and then he talks about the lost or prodigal son. He knows alone that all humanity is lost and in need of being found. The scriptures tell us, for the Son of Man has come to, in my instance, seek and rescue. Jesus said, seek and save that which is, and he called them lost. He says that in Luke 19, 10. So that's why he tells these three stories. There is purpose behind them. Now, what's unusual, not only do I have the same text next week, but I'll show you a different sense of what Jesus meant. But this week, we're going to do this. And that's why he tells these three stories and how people became lost. Because some people, like the little girl or little boy, don't understand why they're lost, don't know that they're lost, and they don't know that they're in need of being found by their parents. And so he tells these three stories in three different ways and taken together as a kind of a unit here, the stories give a kind of full perspective of God's mission and ours as well in reaching the lost. Last week, I talked about the Titanic. We had boats up here, lifeboats we called them, in which we tried to get people in. And so that became the catalyst for these next couple of Sundays. If you look at Luke 15, you'll notice from verse 4 to 7, there's a story. I call it lost out of carelessness. Now, this lost sheep illustrates a person who's moved away from God unthinkingly. Think about it. You got a sheep. In fact, Jesus said there was a hundred. And one out of that hundred got lost. You ever thought about how? Well, it works that way with, if you look today, maybe that sheep puts his head down and he begins to eat. And then there's another clump and he begins to eat and then another and then another and then another. And he never looks up. He just kind of wanders off. And all of a sudden he realizes he's no longer part of the fold. He's no longer part of that group. He's moved away. Now, he didn't do this on purpose. He unconsciously does that, one clump at a time, so to speak. The sheep wanders away from some feeding place to the next, his eyes down, his head down. He never looks up. It's a, it is short-sightingly, if you want to call it that, unaware that he's not where he should be. In fact, all the time that he's wandering away, he's straying farther and farther away from the flock and the shepherd's care. The sheep never intended to get lost. He never meant to walk away and not be found. He never meant to stray so far that he couldn't find his way back. He just sort of unintendingly moved away. In the same fashion, people get caught up in the cares and riches of this life. And so we live in a world that has basically taken its eyes off of God and they're wandering somewhat aimlessly off course. They didn't necessarily mean to. They were not anti-religious. They weren't anti-God. They just got busy. They got sidetracked. They got off course trying to find something else. We live in that kind of world. I've seen people that would find a hobby or, a, or a, the perfect job, and before long, they're missing church on Sunday, and little by little, they wander away altogether from the flock of God and the care of the good shepherd. They didn't, if you say to them, did you mean to do that? No, I didn't mean to do that. I just kind of got caught up. 
I just got caught away in what I was trying to get done. I didn't realize that I'd moved away from the shepherd's care. He was hungry. He's feeding. He's going. He sees something. He goes after it. And that's what Jesus is trying to convey here. Many people are lost because they simply never look up. They never ask, where did I come from? Where, why am I here? Where am I going? Those are valid questions. God, what am I here on this earth for? There used to be a little song. I'm old. <laughs> it was in the 60s. It was by a group called Grassroots. It was called Let's Live for Today. I hear it from time to time. And the other day I heard it and I listened closely. And one lyric said, And don't worry about tomorrow, just live for today. That's kind of a horrible way to live. And yet most of America probably do that. Jesus simply talked about those who just simply gave over to that kind of lifestyle. The people on, I mentioned the Titanic, the people on the Titanic last week that we talked about were unconscious of the fact that in a few hours, many of them would slip into a watery, icy grave off the north of the sea. And so... Uh, during the time that we had the lifeboats up here, we filled one up. Uh, we had uh, Tim Edenfield's boat up here. It was, it was kind of real nice, and uh, several people come up after church and wanted it instead of the little boats that we gave out. I texted Timmy after service, and I said, hey, I uh, just want to let you know, uh, a lot of people wanted your boat, so I auctioned it off and gave the money to missions. Thanks. He didn't like that. And I'm scared of him, so I recluded real quick. But I remember at one point, we filled a boat up. There was no other, at that time, no other boats up here. If you haven't seen the video or the service, go online and look at it. Um, I asked Donnie and Yuli to be the last ones. So they came up, and there was one seat left. Somebody slid over, and there's one seat left on the boat. And when Donnie came up, I said, I'm sorry, there's no room. And he looked at me real funny, and he said, what about her? And I said, okay, we can take her, but you have to stay. He said, I wasn't expecting that. He said, I wasn't expecting it to be so impactful in my life that she was going to get to go, and I was going to have to stay. And so that's what all last week was all about, and that's what all this week is about. It's about us being able to provide lifeboats and boats for people to come in and be rescued from their lostness. So Jesus talks about that, that parable, and he said, the, the one wandered away, and I left the 90 and 9, and I went out. And, and the picture of the scene is that he finds that lost sheep, and he doesn't just run him back. He doesn't kick him. He doesn't get back to the foe. He says he picks him up, puts him on his shoulder, and walks him back in. So it shows us that even in our carelessness, even as we walk away trying to find our own thing, doing whatever it is we want to do, that God still loves us, and he cares about us, and that he wants us in the ship, and that he wants us in the rescue boat, and he wants us to be rescued. So it becomes our job to search for those people. The second thing that he does, he tells immediately a second of those parables. This one is about a lost coin. Normally, old Mid Western, uh, uh, Eastern uh, headwear often was made of coins that dangled. Usually 10 or 12 or 15 of them might be on there. They were normally somewhat valuable. I studied uh, some of this uh, old stuff, uh, commentaries about it, and some suggested that each uh, piece of silver was worth a good bit of money, at least in that day and time. And so the story goes that the woman has this headdress or whatever it is, and she loses a coin. And when she loses that coin, 
she, the scripture says she lit a candle and immediately she searched the house. Now it uses the word swept and look, she, she turned everything upside down. She swept in every corner. She swept under the furniture. You can just almost imagine her frantic to some degree, searching, 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 looking, looking, trying to find. You ever done that? I, I have. Just, you know something's got to be there, but you can't find it. And you're just looking and looking and going, I know that it's here. It's got to be here. That's somewhat of what I get out of her. And Jesus has said, she lit a candle and they searched the house diligently until she found it. The idea is she never gave up. The idea is I'm not quitting. I'm going to do whatever it takes to do that. And so unlike the coin or the coin, it, it can't bleat like the sheep and call for its owner. Or like the one we'll read next, the prodigal son who can change his mind and come home, this animal, this silver rather, cannot find its way back. It has been done in by the mishandling of somebody else. What does that mean? Well, people often become victimized and damaged through victimization of other people. I want you to think about that for a second. The perpetrators of their sorrow give a, a kind of a broken concept of God. They often do things for their own part, so to speak. Jesus warned his disciples one day. He said, you're not to cause an offense or to become a stumbling block to little ones. He wasn't talking just about little kids, but he was talking about anyone new in Christ. And I found something to be true. Churches can critically injure their own people. It wasn't long after I'd become a Christian. I was still young, only been a Christian maybe a couple of weeks or three maybe. And uh, so I had long hair, crazy hair, wild hair. It was, it was like, and, uh, and somebody came to me and said to me, and I guess they were trying to be gracious, but they said, if you need money for a haircut, I'll give it to you. That could have been devastating to a new Christian. You know, it's a wonder I didn't pack up, walk out, and say, if that's Christianity, I don't want any part of it. But then I found that I did the same thing one time. Wasn't long after I'd been a Christian, you know, of course, back then, women were not allowed to wear slacks. Whatever your opinion is of that, that's up to you. But it's not valid in a church to make people try to bend to your rules. But I was in Savannah, Pastor Corsi was pastoring down in uh, Savannah at that time, and he had some sort of revival campaign, and I remember that we went. And uh, that night was a great worship service, as I recall, and there was this lady down at the front, and she was just into it, boy. She was just getting blessed of the Lord. And I looked up, and she had a pair of pants on. And oh, holier than thou me, I said, mm, I can't believe she's getting all that and she's wearing slacks. I'm confessing this morning. And I felt the Lord just in that small, still voice say, who's getting blessed, you or her? And boy, all of a sudden I'm like, oh, Lord. You can get chastised from me, that's one thing. When you get chastised from God, that's backing up, boy. And I felt terrible about it. And I realized that it was from preconceived notions and ideas, good, bad, or indifferent. I'm just saying. We don't want to wound, we don't want to wound our people. I remember pastoring a little church over in Alabama, and there was this couple or this family that was in our church, and he was a, he was one of my board members, and his wife was a precious woman who saw after our children when Teresa worked. She would often babysit when I had visits and other things to do. She loved and 
treated our boys so special. She had three girls. And uh, there again, I was uh, convinced in my early Christianity that God was just, and I don't mean to give liberty to dress in any way you want to dress. I'm not giving liberty to that. I'm just saying we put out some things that are ridiculous. And so she showed up on Wednesday night and she had pants on. Her children had pants on. I'm like, oh, Lord. And I, I mainly because I knew I had people in there that would complain and gripe. And so I went to her and I said, Miss Janella, suppose you maybe could get your girls to wear dresses. Oh, my God, how stupid was I? I mean, that's just the dumbest thing. And I remember her reply, even to this day, it's been close to 47 years or so. She said, well, Pastor, my girls don't get home till late in the evening. By the time we get in and get them fed, it's time to go to church. And so they just wear what they've worn that day. And if it bothers people, then, well, maybe just better we don't come. <clears throat> Boy, I went to her almost immediately after that. I said, Janelle, I'm so sorry. That's ridiculous what I said. I said, I want you to come regardless. You see, church, we don't think about it. But we have a tendency to wound our own people. We have a tendency to to do disaster where it doesn't need to be. God never asked me to be jury. The fact of the business is he never asked me to clean up the fish. He just said, catch them, put them in the boat, and I'll clean them up. And I don't have any jurisdiction in that. My job is to love them. Let me bring it back to where I'm talking about. I don't know why this coin was lost. I don't know if it was lost because she didn't care for it. Maybe she didn't take good care and making sure that when she wore it or before that every little thing was put on there well. I don't know if she just took it and and just treated it bad, throwing it in a corner or whatever. But in any way, form or fashion, Jesus is saying, through the carelessness of others, sometimes people get lost. And so many of the churches in America today, many of our young people have been lost to the faith because of the poor example of older saints. which made me sit back and go, Lord, I don't want to be a part of that. I want to take care of them. In fact, we don't need to run our old people off. We need them to become examples of love and consideration and care. We need our older people to reach out to our younger people and take care of them. Do whatever it is. Hold their babies when they need to come and pray. Whatever we need to do to make sure that coin stays attached, that's good. I even went a little deeper than that. How many of our preachers have misused the word of God to dupe people out of their money or their property? Hell's going to be full of people who tricked, duped, and just took them. You got them on TV crying. Oh, send me your money. I'll go off the air. And I'm hollering, go off the air. Who cares? I'm not out here to dupe you out of your money. I asked you to give last week and this week and next week to, that we might put more lifeboats in the water. But I guarantee you not a nickel of it is for my own personal use. I don't have time. The world has been leading people astray for years. But I'm afraid the church has been nearly as bad by hurting those that they've been called to hold into the fold. Finally, Jesus told a third story. This one is not just carelessness. It's not just carelessness of others, but it's carelessness of choice. The last story Jesus told is about a young boy. 
he goes to his dad, which was uncommon, and says to him, look, whatever it is I'm going to get when you die, I want it now. And so the dad doesn't argue with him. He doesn't uh, rebel against him. He simply does whatever he does and gives it to the son. The son, in turn, leaves home, heads to a, one scripture says distant place, one says a far place, but it was away from home. And there, away from his father's leadership, he spends all the money, he lives riotous living, he does all the things that he shouldn't do, and he finds himself one day broken without friends. You'll have a lot of friends when you got money, you'll have a lot of absent people when you don't have money. So he finds himself without no money. To, do, to try to get some help, he gets a farmer to hire him to work in his pig pen. And so he goes out every day and he feeds the pigs and he gives them the corn and he does whatever he does. And the Bible said he looked at that, that husk, he looked at that corn, whatever he was given, and he was hungry. But he didn't have anything to eat. I told him earlier when first service when I was a teenager I left home and I went to live with uh, in the late 60s and I went to live with the hippies up in Atlanta on Peachtree Street it was full of kids that were gone and strayed away from home in fact I went to sleep one night by myself in a room in a place they called the White House and the next morning I woke up and there's probably 40 kids in the room I didn't know any of them I remember one day being on the street hungry, oh, my God. I didn't weigh but about 120 pounds, soaking wet. I told somebody I wouldn't have to, man. <laughs> I am today. I was so hungry that I didn't know what to do. And there was a lady, a black lady, who owned a hot dog place, and she sold two hot dogs for a quarter. And I didn't even have a quarter, not even a quarter to buy a hot dog kind of came to myself and stuck my thumb out, hitchhiked back to Savannah and went to my dad's mom's home in Westwood, knocked on the door. My dad didn't say a word to me. He didn't say, you brat. He didn't say, boy, you've been a rebellious no good. He opened the door and said, come on in, mama's got supper ready. Words? <laughs> Words that I longed to hear because I was a hungry boy. This boy comes to himself. That's what Scripture says. He came to himself. He realized his lostness. So he makes his way back home. The father, the whole time, apparently is watching. I, I kind of gather that, and this is just my side of it, I can almost see him walk to the road and every day cup his hand over his eyes and look for his son not knowing whether he'll ever come back, not knowing if he'll ever darken his door again. One day he walks out and he looks and there's a figure. And as that figure gets closer, his heart starts to beat fast. All of a sudden he recognizes him. He doesn't fold his arm and say, I told you so. He never did that. Scripture says he ran. He ran to where he was. He threw his arms around him. He hugged him. My son who was dead is now alive. My son who was gone is home. And with that, he called his servant, said, bring me a robe. I often call it a robe of righteousness. He said, bring a ring. I call it the ring of reconciliation. He said, and by the way, bring some sandals for his old nasty feet. He's home. Man, what a thrill it must have been to see that long lost son come home. In fact, he told his servant, he said, that old calf we've gotten fattened up over on the back 40, let's kill him and have a party. And so they killed that fatted calf and they were having a party. <laughs> and then the old church rose. I mean, the eldest son rose up he comes back to the home and he hears the music he doesn't go in he stands there for a minute servant comes out he said hey what's going on in there he said your brother 
is home. You can almost see the scowl on his face. That's sorry, no good for nothing. Why would he come home? And what are they doing in there? Your dad's throwing a party. A party. He doesn't deserve a party. Oh, yeah. He's killed a fatted calf. We having a time. Won't you come on in? Oh, no, I'm not going in there. What have I ever done? I've done everything. I've been the good guy. I've stayed home. I've done everything that I should do, and nobody's thrown a party for me. Boy, you hear that in some of the churches today where people are like, what do you mean bring that guy in and let him do this or that woman and do that? I've been here all my whole life. Maybe you've never asked to do it. I don't know. But he comes home. The father finally figures out he hadn't come in. He wonders why, and he comes out, and he says to his son, what's the problem? What's wrong with you, Bo? You never killed a fatted calf for me. You never put a robe on me. You never put a ring on my finger. Never put shoes on my feet. How come this low life can go off and spend all of his money and then come crying home, and you take him in? And he says it best. My son, which was gone, has come back. My son, which was dead, is now alive. And Jesus is conveying to us the lostness of humanity. He's lost, but now he's found. Sometimes I wonder why we've lost the urgency to win the lost. And I'm praying that God would put it back in this church and in our hearts to win the lost, as one old song said, at any cost. That we're to reach out, whether it's a lost sheep or a lost coin or a rebellious son, that we're to reach out and somehow get them. I remember way back when I was a sinner, and one day, I was sitting out on my motorcycle, long hair, no shirt on, and a young lady from this church back then came by and said, hey, I just want to invite you to church. I scowled. I'm not coming to your stupid church. Little did I know I'd be the pastor of this stupid church. <laughs> but I wondered... Did she really care? I wonder if God looks at us sometime and say, do you really care? I've asked God this morning to prepare my heart when I meet anybody to be prepared to share the gospel. I don't want to be offensive, but I want them to know they're lost and they need Jesus. And that's what this story is all about. The son is deliberately lost. He chose to be lost. Unlike the coin, unlike the sheep, he chose to be lost. There's a family that was big in gospel music called Zelma and Ira Stamphill. They stated the gospel as clearly as anyone has ever done when they composed the words to the song and tune there's room at the cross for you. Soon after they composed those words, Zelma left Ira, backslid, sang in nightclubs, had an affair with a show business personality. Five years later, Zelma was killed in a car accident while driving home from a nightclub singing engagement. No one really knows in the seconds of her dying if she ever acted on those words that she had helped to write, words that have drawn countless thousands to an altar of commitment. Though millions have come, there is still room for one. Yes, there is room at the cross for you. Her lifestyle sort of represents all those who once sat in our pews, sang our hymns, prayed with us, but then went out from us. 
for whatever reason, their lostness has occurred. So I prayed this week, Lord, give us a revival. Give us a revival of all of our lost sons and daughters that we might get them in. People without the Lord are lost because they're either ignorant of what God is like, or they're unlike God, or they're away or distant from God. They are lost in all three senses of the story today. Carelessness, carelessness of others, and carelessness of personal choice. I remember the times that I sat in the back of a church at First Assembly of God in Savannah, Georgia as a little boy. I sat on the back row as a young 12, 13-year-old, and I'd feel God calling. I could just sense it, calling, calling, calling. Not always make excuses. Not today. Not today. Not today. Until one day, I never heard him call again. And for many years after that, I never heard that call. And when I heard people preach, it meant nothing. Teresa and I were dating, and one night she said to me, I said something about her going to church, and I said, I'm not going to any stupid church. She said, you just going to hell? I said, oh, yeah, I'm just going to hell. You ought to have loser tattooed on your forehead. I was so dumb. But then one night, one morning, or actually early, the Lord came and visited me. Did you see him? No. Could you tell what he looked like? None of that was important. I was so happy that he found me and that he took time to come and see me. That day, that morning, I gave my heart to the Lord. That evening, I was in this church, only on the other side of town, where people prayed for me. That day started a walk that's been now for 40, 50 years. I've walked with him. And I've never regretted it. Though challenges have come, and though things sometimes are different, if we under, fail to understand the lostness of those around us, we'll not have any sense of urgency of God to find them. And for anybody that's in this room today that's lost, there's room at the cross for you. Though millions have come, there is still room for one. Yes, there's room at the cross for you. Sing it with me, Don. Though at the cross. 